assurances from God. I mean, believe this is the time when people need a lot of assurances from God to those in Christ. You're in good hands with God. Amen. I mean, seeing the commercial in the middle of the night, the man's talking to a guy named Jake. His wife comes down, Jake, who? Jake, what are you wearing, Jake? Well, I'm wearing button-down shirt and khakis. You know the commercial. And uh, this purpose of this message is so you won't call Jake in the middle of the night, but you'll take your notes out and call God and look at what he has given us as far as assurance in his word. I do look back and maybe they still use the commercial for State Farm and that's the beautiful graphic that I was able to find for today. I used to, all my adult life, I heard that State Farm, you were in good hands with State Farm. I guess Jake has become pretty famous, but I still like the idea of you're in good hands. And I like that in respect to what we're talking about today. We're in good hands with Jehovah God, aren't we? Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word that inspires us, that motivates us, that secures us. Let, let this speak deep into our hearts today. And Father, I thank you for anointing this to our hearts and to our understanding. And we give you thanks. And everybody said, Amen. Assurances. Well, we, we have to have insurance. That's a, that's a fact. Uh, there's a lot of lawyers out there, and you got to have insurance. It's just a fact of life. Someone said if we didn't have to pay for insurance, we'd have a bunch of money. But if you didn't have insurance, there's a lawyer that's going to take your money. you got to have protection for a lot of different reasons. So we have assurances from God in His Word. I love Hebrews 12, too. I've, I've quoted this and looked at this so many times. Looking unto Jesus, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Finisher means Jesus will carry us through to the end. Come on. Finisher means someone who completes a project, someone who finishes things. On the cross, Jesus cried out, Jaron, it is finished. It's done. It's a done deal. I'm here, I'm here glad that Jesus says it's done. It's finished. And we keep our eyes on him, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, all the way to the end. The Bible is a collection of 66 books and has one primary theme. You can cut the Bible anywhere you decide to cut into it, from Genesis to Revelation. Cut into it, open it up, any place from Genesis to Revelation, 66 books, cut into it anywhere, and you have to cut through the cord of redemption, because that's the main theme, whether it's Rahab, the cord that she put out the window, all the way through the Bible, the cord of redemption. That is the theme, the primary theme, God's redemption of man. And we have come to know that that redemption is found in Christ. There was a foreshadow of the, the sacrifices until Christ fulfilled the first four feasts that God instituted. And there was atonement for sin. But when Christ came, there came a redemption through his, and by his blood. Redemption means 
refers to salvation from sin, from death, and from the wrath of God. I tell you what, redemption is a wonderful word. I said in the New Testament, it refers to salvation from sin, from death, and from the wrath of God. Deliverance means payment paid, a price paid for our deliverance. When you think about the word salvation, you think about the word the blood covenant. You also think about the word deliverance. Let me give you an example in the, in the Old Testament. Moses stands there at the Red Sea, and he makes this great proclamation, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And God opens up the waters, and they go across on dry ground. Deliverance. And I like that. We're saved. We are redeemed. Salvation from sin, from death, and the wrath of God. Paul says to the Thessalonians, God has not appointed us to incur his wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. I love that. God's wrath is going to be poured out upon this world. And I do believe in the heart of my hearts, God has not appointed us to incur his wrath, but to obtain salvation. Someone said, are, you, are we going to go through the tribulation or not? Well, I really can't tell you 100%. I believe the preponderance of the evidence for well, the I see scripture is that there's a chance that we will escape the wrath of God because he's not appointed for us to uh, incur his wrath, but to obtain deliverance, salvation. But I do know this. If we have to go through some of the tribulation, God will be with us and he will take care of us no matter what. But I, I really tend to believe the preponderance of the evidence, and that's what the judge tells the, the jury. Look at the preponderance. Look at the historical thing. The wrath of God was not poured out until Abraham, Lot, and his family were out of the city. You just see, the, the waters didn't come until Noah was in the boat. So I, I want to trust that scripture. In Christ, we see ourselves in Christ, and we see Christ in us. But today we're going to focus on in Christ in Christ. We have salvation, which means redemption, which means deliverance. We have salvation, which is mighty in its outcome. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath to come. I believe that salvation in Christ is mighty in its outcome. It's mighty and it's a blessing. How many are glad that you can proclaim the salvation that you have received in Christ? In Christ, in Christ, we have been much more than being now justified by his blood. And then in verse 10, I like this constant, much more, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved. Certain of our salvation through his living in us. Christ is in us. We are in him. Christ is living his life in us, through us. And someone said, well, you, there's nobody that can live a Christian life. And the response was, you're right about that. But Christ in us can live that life through us. As we yield to him, we live the Christian life. Christ in us, we are in Christ. In Christ, we have redemption. That is the channel of all blessings from God, Romans 3, 24, being justified by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ. In Christ we have redemption that is the channel of all blessings from God. Paul says being justified by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ. 
In Christ there is justification that is irrevocable in his character. Galatians 2.16, we live, we like anyone else. We have to learn to believe in Jesus Christ so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not of or by the law. I feel sorry for people who are trying to find justification by do's and don'ts and rules and laws. Uh, I like uh, the Wesley brothers when they were trying to determine what's worldliness. And you know, in, in the full gospel background that we all have, some of us have, man, uh, it, it boiled down to rules and what you could do and what you couldn't do. And it was harsh, harsh. I went my first church I went into there was a, a list going into the platform area where the choir sang and there was a pile must have been 20 do's and don'ts if you if you can't do these things or if you do these things you're not allowed to get up and sing my first act at that church was tear that thing up and rip it up the wesley brothers had it right it's not a list of do's and don'ts and rules and laws. He says, whatever, John Wesley said, whatever turns you on to God is good. Whatever turns you off is not good. And better leave it alone. That's a good rule to go by. What fires you up to love God is good. What takes away that love for God is not good for you. You best leave it alone. Amen? That can help us get a good understanding about what's worldly and what's not worldly for us. In Christ, there is justification that is irrevocable, we said, in its character. In Christ, we have a position that is unparalleled to anything in this world. Raised us up with him and made us to sit with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I mean, I believe that's the best place to be. I got a pastor friend of mine out in Moyoc, North Carolina, close to the ocean, and his name of his church is the place to be. <laughs> That's what they call it, the, the place to be. I preached there. I sure am. I'll tell you, the place to be is with Christ, seated in heavenly places in Christ. Come on. Raised up with him, made to sit with him in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. In Christ we are delivered from all condemnation. Paul says in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no, everybody say no, in all, no condemnation to them which are, what, in Christ Jesus. I know sometimes churches have been guilty of trying to put condemnation on people. And as I think some preachers actually have, they're, they're good at it. They can put it on people. But in Christ, how many are glad you're in Christ? There is there, I mean, it's like it's getting pretty emphatic. There is now therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Satan will work on you. Satan will come and try to put condemnation on you. You're going to have to tell him that he doesn't have a license to fish in your territory. <laughs> Bringing up old stuff of your life. Well, that old stuff of your life that wasn't good has been put under the blood. You just stick the blood of Christ in his eye and tell him to go away. In Christ, we are chosen in the holiness of his person. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 1, 4, chosen us, chosen me, chosen you, us in him, that we should be holy. Holiness. Not a bunch of rules and laws, but whatever causes you to lose your affection for God, you better stay away from it. Whatever fires you up to serve God, that's where you need to go. 
in Christ. We have been accepted. I got good news. In Christ we have been accepted to untold riches. Ephesians 6, 1, 1, 6, he says, that the glory of his gracious gift might rebound to his praise, wherein he has made us accepted in his beloved Son. I'm here glad that you have been accepted in his beloved Son. There are people that have lived their life never feeling like they belong or never feeling like they're good enough. I want to tell you today, if you are in Christ and you have received him as your Savior, in Christ we have been accepted that the glorious, gracious gift might rebound to his praise that we did this morning, wherein he has made us accepted in his beloved Son. Isn't this not beautiful words and poetic words that touch our souls? In Christ, we have an endowment that is sufficient for all of our needs. Paul said in 419 of Philippians, God shall fill every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Come on. God is sufficient for all of our needs. In Christ, there is enough grace that is impregnable in its protection. Oh, the grace of God. 2 Timothy 2, 1. Strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. One translation I really thought was interesting. said, be empowering thyself in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I forget what translation it was. I usually try to put it down when there's a different one. Be empowering thyself in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I'm here glad that we live our lives in the grace of God. The grace, the favor of God. Folks, I'm going to tell you, there's nothing, there's nothing that can compare with the favor of God in your life. Nothing. If you have the favor of God, man, I'll tell you, you got it going. He can give you favor with people that don't even know they're giving you favor. And if it was up to them, they wouldn't give it to you. But they don't know why they're doing it. It's amazing. Throughout my life, God has given me so much favor with people. It's amazing. And they were surprised that they were doing it. They say, what's wrong with me doing that? I didn't mean to do that for old Dave. I went to tell a man off one time for using my driveway. <laughs> yeah, I told you one time, maybe somebody I told somebody this. There was this guy using our driveway, and uh, I uh, was going to go tell him, if he's going to use that driveway, he's going to have to help pay for that stone that we couldn't afford to put down which we had to pay through the nose for a long driveway. As I was going to his car, as he was coming up through there after work, going up the driveway at our church, I was going to tell him, if he's going to use our driveway, you need to pay for that rock. We don't mind. And God said, don't you, you go and tell him you're glad that he could use it. I said, God, what? Now, I, I told him, I, I said, we're so glad you can use this driveway to get to your horse farm behind the church there. The, the man, in the next number of years, wound up giving me a half a million dollars. I was glad that I bit my tongue. <laughs> Sometimes you've got to watch your trip on your lip if you're not careful. That man helped me build Teen Challenge, he helped me build Renewal Ministry, and wound up giving me a half a million dollars to do what we were doing in ministry. Sometimes you've got to be careful what you say to people. In Christ Jesus, there is a keeping that is certain in its security. 
Philippians 4, 7, the peace of God shall guard your hearts and thoughts. That day he guarded my tongue. Man, I needed somebody to guard it. I'm here needing somebody to guard your tongue. Last week we talked about that, remember? Needing God's help with our tongue to keep it straight. Shall so guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. One translation says, Mount guard over. I like that. In Christ Jesus, there is untold joy that is satisfying in its nature. Philippians 3, 3, Paul says, We are truly circumcised, which worship God in the Spirit, and we rejoice in Christ Jesus. Come on. In Christ Jesus, there is untold joy. Happiness, joy. Not the happiness the world understands, but a deep joy that comes in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, there are saints. Yes, really. Look around. Some of them are here. <laughs> I said some of them. I mean all of them. There are saints, many of them. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, Paul says, In the congregation of God's people at Corinth, they're called to be saints. Now, I know that you may not feel that you're a saint. And some things you did last week that God saw you did do, <laughs> he probably says that you don't look too saintly either, but we're still called saints because that's what God looks upon us. We're called the saints of the Most High God. Sometimes we don't always do saintly things. Sometimes we're not always as saintly as we should be, but we are called the saints of God because we're in Christ. You are a saint of God. Come on. In Christ, there is oneness that is inseparable in its bond. Galatians 3.28, all distinctions between the Jews, the Greeks, the slaves, the free men, the male, the female, have vanished, for you are all one in Christ. Come on. If you don't look like me, that's a blessing. No matter who we are, we're all one blood, and we're all in Christ. I like that. It's all vanished. All, di all distinctions between Jews and the Greeks and the slave and the free men, the male and the female, have vanished. For you all are one in Christ. Come on. In Christ there is life unending and eternal and forever. Romans 6, 23. Sin pays servants. Yes, yeah, sin does pay. It pays its servants. But the wage is death. Okay? So yeah, sin pays, but it but the the payment is death. That's not hard to understand. But the gift of God, notice the, when you put these together, sin pays, yes, but its wage is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Come on. In Christ, we are filled with the fullness of God. Colossians 2, 9 and 10, for in Christ... There is all of God in the human body. Trey translation. Verse 10. So you have everything when you have Christ, and you are filled with God through your union with Christ. How many are glad that you can be filled with the fullness of God in Christ? There's people that are full of a lot of things, but I'm glad that we are full of God in Christ. Our assuring God gives us confidence to face any and everything with boldness. The Almighty God, God is the Almighty God to bless us. Genesis 17:1. Now in this verse, chapter 
Abraham is turning, Abram is 99 years old. When Abram was 99, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am Almighty God El Shaddai, and I can complete what I say I will do. I will do what I promise. I'm able to do what I promise. He, so he says, when Abram was 99, the Lord appeared and said, I am the Almighty God El Shaddai able to do what I have promised. I mean, I'm glad that God is Almighty God, El Shaddai, who can do what He promises that He will do. God is the eternal God to secure us. Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God is your refuge. Underneath are His everlasting arms. Come on. Leaning on the everlasting arms. We sung that years ago, didn't we? Our assuring God. God is the almighty God to bless us. He can fulfill what he promises. He's the eternal God to secure us. He is the faithful God to assure us. Hebrews 11:11. 11, 11. Through faith, Sarah conceived because she judged him faithful who had promised. And she was an old woman. She was a nursing home woman. She lived in a nursing home. <laughs> she was an old lady. Sarah, through faith, conceived. Because she judged him faithful who had promised. God is the loving God to cheer us. Jeremiah 31, 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. With loving kindness, I have drawn you to myself, is what he says. So God is almighty God to bless. God is almighty God to eternal God to secure us. He is the faithful God to assure us. He's the loving God to cheer us. I have loved you with an everlasting love and loving kindness I have drawn you. He is the mighty God to deliver us. Deuteronomy 4.37. By his mighty power, he brought you up out of Egypt. Come on. I mean, you're glad you come out of Egypt. There's some people who want to go back to Egypt, but I don't want to go back. There's nothing there. Nothing there. God is the my, he is the powerful God to strengthen us. Second Timothy 4:17. The Lord stood with me. Paul said this was a hard time what Paul was going through. He said the Lord stood with me and he strengthened me. God is the victorious God to overcome for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be unto God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm here glad he's the victorious God that overcomes for us. He's the wise God to enlighten us, James 1, 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of him, and he will give it liberally. If you want to know something, ask, and he'll tell you, and then he won't make a big deal about it. He'll just tell you, bless you, give you wisdom. And the King James Version says, and he upbraideth not. Well, what in the world does upbraideth not mean? It simply means he won't make a big deal about it. He'll give it to you. He'll do what you ask. He'll tell you what you need to know. And he won't make a big deal about it. Okay. God is the wise God. God is the near God to sustain us. Isaiah 50, verse 8. This is kind of a cool one here. You're like this. God, the near God to sustain us, speaks of this. Those who would contend with me or accuse me, those who would contend with me or accuse me will have to answer to the one who justified me or justifieth me. Come on. The zealous God to keep us. 2 Peter 1 3. According to his divine power that has given us all things that pertain unto life, godliness, through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue. 
He's a zealous God that keeps us. He's the near God that sustains us. He's the wise God that enlightens us. He's the victorious God who overcomes for us. He's the powerful God who strengthens us. He's the mighty God who delivers us. He's the loving God who draws us and cheers us. He's the, he's the faithful God who assures us. He's the eternal God to secure us. He's the almighty God can do what he promises he will do. There's no better place to be than in Christ. There's no greater assurance that can be found except in God. Keep this sheet, and every now and then you may want to look at it and see all the things that we have assurance in Christ. God is our assurance today. And I think we live in a time when we need assurance. Amen. Isaiah, this is not on your list, but Isaiah 40, 29, he gives power to the faint. Psalms 27, 1, he sustains. In Psalms 27, 1, he removes fear. In Psalms 31, 2, he defends us. In Psalms 46, 1, he helps us. A very present help in the time of trouble. In 2 Corinthians 1, 10, he delivers us. Who delivered us from so great a death? In Psalms 103, 3, he forgives us. In Psalms 103, 3, he heals us. In Jeremiah 50, 34, he redeems us. 1 Corinthians 15, we read, he gives us victory. And Acts 1, 8, he gives us spiritual power. I mean, you just go through the scriptures. I didn't do all of those. But it, God gives us all the assurance you'll ever need for living in a crazy, mixed-up world. Come on. Let's stand together. And Ed, they're going to come back and sing for us. Another song that I think everybody's going to get excited about.